Hope everybody's doing well today. I want to welcome everybody to the Unimpressed Podcast. We have a friend calling in from Los Angeles, and his name is Elio Murillo, and I think I got that right. Kind of, I might have butchered it a little enough. bit. Might have butchered a little bit, but he is a engineer now at Blue Origin, and he was recently at NASA, previous in his career, and uh, just came out with a new book. So, welcome to the show. Thanks, John, for having me. It, it's an honor to be able to share the story and for opening up the space. When you talk about this journey you've been on, you're originally from where? I was born in Ecuador. And many, many things caused my mom to, to, to decide to leave. Primarily, the economic system started to collapse in the 90s. Uh, Ecuador is one of the four countries, I think, right now to, to be dollarized, which causes restrictions uh, in several ways. At the time, it was a good idea. And then also the, the the relationship with my father wasn't the best, so it was it, it was the best thing for my, for for my mom to leave with me and my future in mind. You know, it's one of those things that I I, I try to put myself in my mom's shoes, and and I can't imagine after nearly having a thirty year career in education, she gave all that up to make sure that I would do okay. Uh, I was about four when we left, and from there I grew up between New York City and Puerto Rico. Life circumstances took us to Puerto Rico. My brother, my older brother, who's 17 years older than I am, ended up marrying a Puerto Rican. So uh, that opened up the opportunity for my mom to to go teach again. And I grew up in Puerto Rico in a bilingual setting. From there on in 2006, uh, folks may be familiar that the Puerto Rican economy started kind of spiraling downward uh, for a variety of reasons, being a colony of the United States. Not much the local leadership can do without oversight. It's it's uh, it's, it's it's a difficult situation. I mean, the first wave of Puerto Ricans to leave uh, to the continental United States was in the 50s. That's the first major migration um, that happened, and then the second major one is ha- is started happening in the mid 2000s. The board that was uh, forced on the island by the United States Congress under Obama uh, has caused more than anything foreign investors to come to Puerto Rico or to go to Puerto Rico. And not only that, but also uh, non-Puerto Rican born Americans to go and to go to Puerto Rico and basically have no income tax. And that's not something that, for example, Puerto Ricans that left could go back and take advantage of. It's, 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 a, it's a really difficult situation for the locals. So it's causing much of what's happening to Hawaii. But we're, we're deviating here, but there's a whole topic people should be aware about because at the end of the day, it is a U.S. territory. So so there's more yeah. Americans there than in more than 30 states. Um, and it's it's a group of people that can't even vote for their president. It, it, it's what we had a revolution for, right? And Mm-hmm. Long ago, and, and Puerto Ricans live like that in modern day. Before deviating too much, yeah, that's I, I got to live there. I got to grow up there, and I had a fantastic childhood despite not having much. I was surrounded by a very nurturing community, and uh, opportunities were presented my way primarily because um, my mom instilled with me that education truly was the path forward. And I got to attend one of the local private schools on scholarship, but you know, before we left, and then again in 2006. Things led us to move to New York City, where I started high school. Before that, I, I, I was faced head on with, you know, at the time I didn't realize what it was, but looking back, it was the, the systemic racism that exists with the New York City public schools which is the worst in the country. One of the worst in the country. New York Times did a fantastic job in covering a lot of this a few years ago. And uh, fortunately, I ended up in a decent high school where, again, by the support of teachers, support of mentors, the support of my friends. I think to this day, I am pretty close with a few of them from high school. We pushed ourselves. We gave ourselves access to resources. Many of us first-time graduates or first-time, you know, would be the first to attend college uh, in the United States from our families. And we helped each other. We, we elevated each other by sharing scholarships, sharing studying methods, studying with each other for things like the SAT and whatnot, and helping each other out with applying to colleges. So many of us ended up in in top tier institutions. And in my case, I went to the University of Michigan, did my undergrad in mechanical engineering, electrical engineering as a minor, and then did my master's in space systems design. So uh, ended up in NASA, did a few stints at Boeing, SpaceX, GE Aviation before heading to NASA JPL, and then worked on the Mars mission for six years. So that's my life in a gist and lots happened yeah. in between. Were you bored in school, like in elementary school and high school? Were you kind of bored a little bit? I don't I don't think I was bored. Uh, I, I would never really say that. Uh, I, 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 
Only reason I ask, because I think it takes a very special mind, if you will, to have a, an engineering mindset at that magnitude. You know, you know? I, I challenge that idea. I think okay. I think anybody can truly be an engineer. And and also, let me highlight that at home, there was there was no room for getting anything less than a name when your mom's a teacher. Like that's just not mm-hmm. uh, not okay at home. So so I learned that very early on to have excellence in school. But uh, to challenge that idea a little bit that. You have to have a special mind for it to, to be an engineer. I, I think in my case, for example, from very early on, I loved to do artwork. I painted, I did drawing, and that was something that, 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 that was a huge part of my life growing up. On top of just the interest and curiosity that comes with uh, science and math, which you know speaks the, univer- the, 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 the language of the universe. And what engineering does at the end of the day is teach you critical thinking and how to question things and ask why five times and try to come up with solutions. Pick one of the best 10 that you could come up with that may lead to uh, an optimized solution. And then I think the most difficult part about engineering, especially working in top institutions such as NASA, then becomes the the people skills because you can have a room of 10 engineers and all of them can come up with five solutions. Now, how do you all agree on which one's best? And how do you learn from each other? And how do you learn to share space and how to share resources to make sure that the mission is accomplished? So I, I think there there's a good mix. There's room for everyone in, in engineering. And that's something that I'm very adamant about pushing forward. And yeah, engineering school, really hard. I'm not going to lie. That was insane. It was super intense. Well, well, when I say... When I say special mind, let me just reiterate because I think you touched yeah, sure. on kind of kind of what I'm backing up. I mean, I I'm a, a clear sentient, and you know I, I do things by feel. Like if you see something, I see it times fifteen or twenty. And I think the creativity plays to that. I don't disagree that multiple people can uh, be an engineer, but I think there's a level of a personality that you know is just like you said. You know, it's it's finding an answer, right? Finding the best answer and what rationale you use to do that. And I think that the best will rise to the top, and then the the others will be, you know, they're in they're in the room, but there's 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 a few that can go the extra mile. So, do you think you're a person of that that is trying to search for that answer in what you do? And how many times is those answers deviated within your space? You know, does that make any sense? You're, you may be alluding to thinking outside the box a little bit. I have learned that sometimes the best answer isn't actually the best answer. Sometimes you have to learn to have the humility to understand that sometimes there is such a thing as good enough and you move on because there's so many problems to tackle at once. Mars humbled me in that set because there were a million fires to take care of at once. And yes, you can hyper-focus on one thing, or you can understand that sometimes you got to let go of certain things. Maybe you're not the best at that particular task and the ability to recognize that and to, to involve the people that can actually fix and figure out things with you and you learn from them is as important as coming up with your own ideas. And that is what led us to Mars in the middle of the pandemic, right? Because mm-hmm. uh, so many things were so uncertain. But one thing we knew is that the universe didn't care that COVID was happening. Uh, mm-hmm. We had to get to Mars and we had to launch in July of 2020 for uh, be- Due to orbital trajectory reasons, if we would have missed that window we had then, we would have had to wait 26 months and then ask for our boss, aka the U.S. Congress, to give us $500 million. And that was just not an option. So part part of all of this is engineering is very humbling. Yes, you are going to have standout loud voices at times, as you do in any industry. But I think some of us that have some of our best experiences and get to involve get, get involved in some of these crazy projects are amongst those that can work in collaboration with others. Now, I have a th- this thought rationale thought process. There's there's yeah. two mindsets, and I've talked to a few scientists okay. and uh, and about different technology that's available. Now, okay. if you approach something from a discovery mindset, and I think a lot of people uh, approach things for discovery instead of approaching something from a creation mindset. Have you ever mm-hmm. looked at those two different thought patterns? Because I think sometimes the, the discovery mindset, it's going to take you longer to get there unless you teach yourself or train yourself how something was created. I think you can get to those answers quicker. Have you ever thought about those two different, you know, it's basically one way is 
you know, the discovery mindset is basically what we do now. Now reverse engineer that. Do you think you could get answers quicker if you reverse engineered the discovery mindset? I'm not familiar with these two. I think uh, these are interesting paradigms. Uh, I don't know if it's black and white. I think it's a mix of the two. Um, depending on the context, one may be worthwhile more than the others. And I think they feed into each other, I think, yeah. if, I'm, if I'm interpreting them correctly. Because if you want to create something you may have discovered some kind of problem and maybe that then leads to further discovery down the line. So I don't, I don't know if it's black and white, but probably depending where in the design life cycle that I'm, I'm very used to, um, which yeah. is a prob problem discovery, design, test, iterate, and then repeat that cycle as often as you want for something, um, you're going to be on one of those two paradigms depending where you're at and having that open mind is important to solve some of the biggest, toughest problems uh, that may present themselves. Now, those are interesting, though. I mean, I have some quantum physics coming through, and I didn't know. I didn't know I had this intelligence till I started talking to people in tech. People in entertainment didn't never knew what I was talking about. Sure. So it's so it's interesting you talk to someone who's in the space, playing the game in, in real time, and just kind of get where their mind's at. Because it's like when I talk to a Dr. Stephen Greer, uh, he talks about zero point energy. Do you have any thoughts about any any of these other tech, you know, technology out there that hasn't hasn't been implemented maybe in, into these programs? So I don't know much about quantum physics, and I tend to stay away because that stuff is, uh, <laughs> is is past my pay grade, my degrees. But uh, I think if anything, a lot of these scientific inquiries that people are asking nowadays will have implications in our life that we don't fully understand. Um, we're seeing it right now in the application of artificial intelligence across the board. What does education look like? What does our day-to-day -day look like five years from now? How are kids going to grow up in a world in which they will have a machine that's going to answer every question they ever ask without judgment? It, it, it's Things are going to change rapidly. And I think, yeah, over time with uh, further discoveries in, in, in quantum physics, it's going to accelerate computing in ways that we don't fully understand. It's going to change the way security and encryption is, is handled, the way we communicate even, and especially in space travel, uh, the it's kind of one of the exciting aspects of instantaneous communication when you have paired particles, regardless of their distance, being able to send a signal to each other. Uh, it's going to be exciting because you, right now we depend on the speed of light, which causes a lot of delays because space is so big. But if you have instantaneous communication, that's going to change just the paradigm of just about everything we do in space. So yeah, there's exciting aspects to all of these scientific inquiries. I'm no expert in any of them, but... Uh, as people figure out how to apply them, there's going to be engineers like me that will get creative in how to use a lot of these new insights that we have into the universe. Yeah. What do you think about AI? You know, everybody's having this new, this knee jerk reaction to AI. Mm -hmm. I think, I think for AI to be really successful, it's going to take three to five years. And I, and I want to tell you why, because I think the narratives, uh, the narratives that are out there right now, there's no more narratives left. So until people reset or rebirth, whatever you want to call it, their business or they they birth a business the right way, the AI can only function on the data it's given. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of these companies are jumping out there and, and these companies are off 20 to 30 percent on who their true customer is because they haven't done the work to find out who's really paying the bills. Mm -hmm. So when you plug in AI and you're off 20 to 30 percent, it's still going to give you you may save time, but it's still going to give you the same answer you've been getting in a longer time span. Do you, from your position, do you have any thoughts about uh, how to rebirth or birth things the right way where AI could be a real benefit coming from a pure source? That's an interesting question. I so again. Does that, does that I, translate I, to you a little bit? You know, you understand uh, what I'm saying though, with with these new systems and some of this technology that's coming out. Yeah, I think uh, I think it's not going to be as black and white as 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 we may try to poise it right now. I think right now there's a there there's an enormous undiscovered potential. We are simply not used to thinking with what's about to be unleashed into the world. We're still very early on. These language learning models are very imperfect for the time being. They're getting better by the day, but uh, there's there's a lot of work to still be done. And then the ethics of it is super interesting and the education behind all of it too. I'm an optimist is what I'll say. 
I think uh, there will be some initial pains. There's going to be high barriers to entry into these technologies and the way they get applied. Folks are going to have to get educated one way or not. Our classroom, our classrooms are going to have to change even way quicker than they are right now. Our current education system, I'll speak just for the American education system, is stuck in the past. It has been stuck in the past for decades now. And um, unless we truly figure out how to incorporate some of these technologies, um, I am a bit afraid with the kind of uh, paths and education that people are going to obtain in the next 10 years. But not to say that change won't happen. It's, it may just happen a bit slower than I would want it to. But aside from that, day to day, I'm very excited. One of my close friends, he's a CEO from a learning platform in Latin America called Platzi. His name is Freddy Vega. He recently put out this video. I was at a, at a convention that I was, I was a, a speaker for called A Morning in 2030. And the premise of that is just within a few years, right? We're, we're going to have AI integrated into our lives in, in ways that we don't necessarily fully realize right now. But imagine, right? You wake up one day and you check your device and your device summarizes every tasks that you have to do. You won't forget anything anymore because this, this assistant is going to just be your external memory carrying the things that your brain isn't meant to. Your brain is meant to be used for creation, to generate ideas. Task management is actually not something that our brain is meant for. So it's fantastic that we're going to have uh, this, this virtual assistant with us every day. It's going to remind you of certain things you may want to do with your friends, with your family. It's going to connect you with people that have free time because all these things are carrying your schedule. It's going to help you navigate your relationships with your bosses, with uh, your peers, with the people you manage in a way that um, maybe we're not used to yet. You're going to be able to replicate. This one This one was interesting. I don't want to give too many spoilers because the video is fantastic and I'll share it with you. So maybe you watch it with subtitles. It is in Spanish. For example, one day you're so lost in an idea or you, you have something so difficult that you're carrying and you're dealing with. You may actually have an AI that is formed and trained with the memories and the language of a family member, say a parent that you were close to. And you're going to try and have uh, an exchange of ideas with that parent uh, and, and they may no longer be present. So you can reach out to this AI and have a discussion similar to what you may have had with a parent. Uh, and it may speak in their language. And, 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 and even those kinds of connections are so difficult to fathom. And then, for example, your kid wakes up and rather than bug you with all these questions that you don't have answers to, kid's going to go explore the world in a way that you and I never imagined because they're going to have this assistant that's going to answer everything, hopefully correctly, right? Like for now, I'm, I'm not going to... Yeah. On the premise, yeah. I'm not going to dive into the premise of what the, the nefarious side of, of, of things can be, but hopefully this AI helps them understand the world around them and explore and understand how the world works and how does nature work and why is the, the sky blue, et cetera, right? Like they're, they're just going to have this infinite source of wisdom that they carry with that we didn't have. So what's their adulthood going to look like? All these things that we have to explore, I think is incredibly exciting. The world is going to change. We like it or not. And um, mm -hmm. we either people ride the wave and learn how to swim, or they're just going to have a hard time because it's not even like they're going to be left behind. They're going to be carried in the wave in some way or form, but they may just tumble around rather than get on that surfboard and ride it in a way that's fun. So there's a lot of work to be done, a lot of education, and a lot of initiative people are going to have to take uh, to, to get in, in into the world and at least understand the basics of it. But um, yeah, I'm excited for what's to come is what I have to say about AI. You mentioned education a few times. Mm -hmm. It seemed like that's something you're very passionate about. Do you think... Yep. Do you think the education system is is pushing people to market, uh, say, in your space that don't have the knowledge to really take a position? And you think that needs to change from the foundation up? You feel like some things need to change to improve the, the learning process. What does that look like to you? Yeah, I'm, I'm just using an example. OK, like right now you hear about, oh, kids are just going to get lazy and, and, and they're going to use uh, tools like ChatGPT to write their essays, et cetera. But but then at the same time, okay, there's a tool out in the world now that generates text. Right. Maybe essay writing isn't the best thing that you're going to use now for testing knowledge because that's just an antiquated thing that's literally from anti like antiquity and uh, it no longer fits with this technical paradigm that we live in now. So how about you use these tools such as ChatGPT to instead of, you know, 
wonderful example. Instead of me wanting to learn about George Washington and being forced to read five chapters of a textbook, why don't I go on ChatGPT right now and say, hey, act as George Washington and tell me about the hardest day of your life. And all of a sudden you're learning history, interacting with this tool uh, almost in a personable way, but you're learning facts about whatever their life may have been like. And, and I think that's exciting uh, to, to pick up on. And there's going to be all kinds of creative ways in which teachers are going to have to adapt. Curriculums are not going to necessarily be uh, standardized. Now I think we have the true potential of curriculums being personalized. And that's exciting because every kid has different strengths and mm-hmm. you can't teach a fish how to climb. This is just not going to happen. But instead, this this, this fish maybe have a very special way of swimming and they're, this artificial intelligence is going to help figure that out. And everyone's going to have this potential tapped into in some way. And I think that's the kind of stuff that we should thrive for rather than, than the current paradigm that we have in this country that blows my mind. Uh, you know, Still standardized testing is huge. We treat teachers so poorly. I think there's an opportunity for growth and, and, and we better hop on it because the world is going to change. Maybe that's your legacy, maybe creation for each individual, because that's actually uh, Esther Wo- Wojciechowski, I think I had on the show and her and her husband are at Stanford and she mm-hmm. was California Teacher of the Year. And mm-hmm. she yes. has a very similar thought process, but you kind of fast forwarded that this catering a learning process per individual. If somebody could figure that out, that's a home run because I definitely think that's the way to way to go moving forward. You have platforms right now that are tapping into exploring that, such as Platzi. This is why this, this I became aware of it. Yeah. Uh, the, the the platform I'm talking about in Latin America, and similarly, I'm sure LinkedIn Learning, Coursera, all these popular ones are doing that use tools to tailor what kind of coursework a student may want depending on what they're trying to achieve based on their strengths and weaknesses. Um, And and I think that's fantastic because you're going to be able to have teachers that are more focused on on, on, making sure the students are doing fine, that they have the tools and resources available. And the students are going to be able to explore on their own, work with each other in very creative ways. Um, based on their own personalized experiences. And I think that's fantastic. So I'm excited. Yeah, that's, yeah, I'm excited. That's pretty wild. I mean, you plug into their own, you know, the, the teachers give them the tools, but you plug into your own system per se. Whatever that may be. Would, yeah, that would be interesting. So, you know, you have this book coming out, The Boy that's Reach right. for the Stars. I mean, what, what pushes you, you know, on a daily basis? What gets you out of bed? I mean, what do you, how do you tackle the day? No, that's, thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited. The book came out um, from, from the day of recording here a week ago so it's it's been it's been out there in the world for about a week and people have been sharing all their thoughts and it's been and i've received so much support i'm so grateful for i think in my case what what drives me is to improve communities um that i'm involved with and 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 putting my message out there that you know if it was up to me i'll be honest right i want everybody to be an engineer i want everybody to get involved in this stem world and come over to the space come over to the dark side uh i know that's not going to happen though right so everyone everyone is going to have their own dreams and, and, and stars to reach for. And uh, the, the, the book itself is an invitation for folks to do that, to do just that. And, and, and with their own resilience, uh, with their own humility, seek out knowledge, whatever that may be, to nurture their own communities. Because at the end of the day, nobody can do anything alone. Like when people go around saying that they're self-made, I, no, someone was there for you at some point in time, be it a parent, be it a, a, a mentor, be it people that you're connected with, your friends, somebody's always there for you. So learning to navigate the world in a way in which you can always give back. I think it's incredibly important. That's something that's incredibly important to me because I fully recognize that for me to get where I'm at today, right? I come from nothing. Doors were open for me from all these mentors and teachers that I've had. And I make sure that those doors stay open. And similarly, I try to keep opening more doors as I move along um, and extend a hand and hold that door open for people to come right by. People pass right by me, please go do so. I'm, I'm excited to see how people learn and what can I learn from them as well. So I think that's that's those are the major themes uh, in, in my book, along with talking about mental health. That's something I'm incredibly open in my book. And overworking to me, it, it took me down a burnout rabbit hole that led to depression. And I'm still frankly climbing out of that. And I'm open because I don't want people to go through the nonsense that I went through. And, and everyone has their own respective healing journeys and, and, and ways to go about it. Uh, but it's something that I think is very important. At least everyone develops self-awareness for it. A lot of that is packed in my book and, and I'm excited to share that story.
I want to touch mental illness there for a second. I have one more sure. question. Um, sure. On the mental illness part, you know, I think um, a lot of people understanding sensibilities and understanding human behavior, because I'm on social media and it's a percentage game. And a lot of people, when when they have these, like you're, the thing you said about overworking, that could go the opposite way where you just don't do anything. But I think certain things people take their sensibilities, whatever they're trying to get away from, you know, and and whatever they're trying to get away from or whatever direction they're trying to go, they take this, their sensibilities. And if that's their sweet spot, they kind of exhaust that, that, that narrative and that sensibility right in that space. And they kind of forget about everything else, kind of forget these things that are coming in behind you. You don't really know you're being affected. Do you think, you know, how could we explain that better? You going through it at a different level and a different thought process because you think everything would be great. How do you relate that and explain that to somebody? I think the w- one of the core facets of education that's missing, particularly in the United States, and I and and we don't really talk about this a lot. In at, well, I didn't at all. I'll speak for myself. I didn't see it in Puerto Rico. I didn't see it in New York City. Empathy, right? The, the, this understanding of of, of each other um, and and. And, and not developing judgment as quickly without having curiosity for the other. Um, I think oftentimes we fall in the thought process of, oh, this other person, oh yeah, they're lazy. They're not doing their work or, oh, they're overworking. How can they do that? Why? I'm not like that. Um, but like you mentioned, it, it's trying to understand why they're doing that and whether or not they want help, right? Because we can only help ourselves, but wherever you can extend a hand to someone, it's, 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 and, and create safety for the other. I think it's really important to do because at the end of the day, we are social animals and creating community. And this theme that I keep going back to nurturing community is what's going to push us forward, be it in your local community, be it as a whole country. I think that's really important to talk about. So, so I think empathy and, and understanding the difference between empathy, compassion, and even sympathy are, are topics that we don't necessarily address and we have to figure out as adults. A question that was poised to me recently that I hadn't really thought about, and it's crazy, is like, when was the first time you were asked, how do you feel? I couldn't remember. Mm-hmm. I, I, I really couldn't remember as a kid. I don't think that was asked. I don't think that that was a discussion, at least in my household that we had. Um, and, and a lot of men in particular will say something similar and, and, and having these discussions on top of, yeah, let's, let's get the numbers. Let's learn how to accomplish the numbers and having all these metrics that are going to lead us to quote unquote success, whatever that means, uh, I think is as important, uh, because mm-hmm. at the end of the day, we are humans with emotions and feelings and patterns that are generally developed in our early development, childhood, teenage, early young, uh, early adulthood um, that carry onwards throughout our lives and, and understanding why these things have happened and why we behave in certain ways under certain pressures or under certain conditions. It's one of the best gifts we can, we can give ourselves because then we, are, we become less reactive, more responsive, are more prepared, carry ourselves with more confidence. All these things that ultimately feed back into that uh, let's achieve the numbers game. Right. So it, it, yeah. it's uh, all these very important topics that I think uh, I talk about in my book a bit, but, but I'm passionate and I'm trying to figure out what to do with that in upcoming projects as well. A lot of people don't realize, you know, when you look at subconscious and you look at unconscious bias and then getting to consciousness, you know, understanding that in school was, and for, you know, people realizing that your subconscious is being programmed. When, when, when we're born, we obviously bring some lineage to yeah. the table. We bring an environment that we have to yeah. adapt to, to the table and all those create directions. But however, that subconscious is being programmed. We get to a certain point, we start responding to things with our unconscious bias based on our program. Mm -hmm. And however heavy that subconscious is has been programmed, we can't get, you know, it's harder to, for some people to get to consciousness. And I think if you can identify that in the mental illness space and with something that an example you were talking about, people can't judge a book by its cover. You know, I don't think things are defined by a look anymore. You know, I think you have to communicate, you have to unearth that, that information and, and then maybe head in the right direction. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share, I'm going to share some to that, to that exact topic. One of the, one of the yeah. best books I've read in, in, in these recent months. It's called It Didn't Start With You by Mark Wolin, who is, uh, I think if I remember correctly, he has some high degree of authority in clinical psychology. And I for, it was in one of the big institutions and I can't remember which one, so I don't want to mis mischaracterize uh, him. But 
he talks about exactly this, what, what you just mentioned, that a lot of the stuff and a lot of the ways we carry ourselves aren't even just necessarily from our own lifetimes. Some does carry through genetics and some does carry through our, our, our stories from our families and, and whatever may have happened in the past. And, and there's been some scientific studies into this space that are trying to understand all these things that come from our, from before our own times. And uh, I think one of the beautiful things personally in writing my book is, is, has been exactly this, where I've had to dive into some family stories that I don't know if I would have, if I wouldn't have written the book. Um, and especially now I just turned 30, has led me to have more empathy and more understanding for the sacrifices my mom did my grandparents. Um, it has led to repair within the family that I don't know if it would have, would, would have happened otherwise, or maybe later if a conversation would have started. Um, because we've started to unpack things that have happened, traumas that we've lived through, happy moments that we've all lived through that we didn't necessarily realize uh, they were happy moments, right? Um, and, and express gratitude to each other is something that has led my family to reshape uh, in recent times. And, and, and that's something I, I, I invite others to do because it's, it's a beautiful thing to ask our parents, ask our family members, what happened? Why did it happen this way? Uh, how did you feel about it? How do you feel about it now? What, what, what do you think has, has caused, you know, what has, has come out of all this? So anyways, we, I can go on and on about this because uh, at this point, you know, as an engineer, <laughs> here I am talking about psychology mostly. Um, but I love it. I'm, I'm, I'm with you. Well, I think it goes hand in hand because it's, you know, if you understand the percentages and how percentages affect everything, that's, that's a real thing. And if you're only 30 years old, I mean... We need more 30 year olds like you, man, because this, you've done a lot to be such a young guy. And, you know, we all know about NASA, uh, you know, to some extent we hear about NASA and then we but we don't know anything about Blue Origin. I mean, what mm. uh, what's that like making the move to there and, and how does that look? Fantastic question. Uh, from the things I can talk about, I'm excited uh, at NASA JPL in particular, I was working on the Mars program and did quite a bit of work there with the Perseverance rover and the Ingenuity helicopter. And I tested the vehicle, I developed operations and, and, and implemented even some AI-like features that are now working on Mars. From there, I'm now working on lunar programs. And it's an exciting time for lunar development because of the Artemis program that NASA has been pushing in recent years and will push towards through the 2030s. We're going to get humans to the moon again, and we're going to develop a sustainable presence on the moon. And you're going to have players such as Blue Origin be a part of that. A bunch of technologies are going to come out of this that are going to feed directly into our Earth commerce and infrastructure. I'm just incredibly excited to be a part of it and, and, and bring back that expertise that I've developed in the Mars mission. Again, Mars is really hard <laughs> for a variety of reasons. So is the moon, but because of the, the, the rigor and the work that goes into the Mars missions. I'm bringing that expertise to, to get us back to the moon. I'm incredibly a part of. I think in my case, I'm again, I'm just 30. Most astronauts are in their 40s, 30s, even 60s. Uh, my hope is that in the next 20 years, I make it to the moon personally. And, and that's kind of what I'm working towards, working on, on, on the human landing system with Blue Origin that eventually is going to carry humans back to the moon. And I'm, I'm super pumped to be a part of that mission. Well, I hope that works out, man. That'd be, uh, that'd be a real story, man. To be a real story. Um, <laughs> it's already a real story. I mean, like I said, you being 30 years old and having the accomplishments you've had, I mean, that's a big deal. And I think you should give yourself more credit than you probably do, you know, you know, because I think, <laughs> well, I think, you know, I think when you come sometimes, you know, and I can relate, you know, to some things and, and where you come from and those experiences make you want to give, 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 but you know, maybe the, maybe you need to think about yourself a little bit, but uh, where do we find the book? It's out. You can find it at uh, your favorite library. You can get it on Amazon, Barnes and Nobles, uh, local libraries. I'm super uh, adamant about folks supporting their local libraries and, and, and bookstores. But yeah, you can find it anywhere. I appreciate any and all of the support. You can even find it on audiobook, which is crazy to say because I heard it for the first time a few days ago. And it's just like, ah, this is, this is surreal. Uh, but again, I'm just excited to share the book and inviting folks to follow their own dreams and, and, and reach for their own stars. That's what it's all about. All right. So the book, The Boy Who Reached for the Stars, a memoir. And this is uh, Elio Murillo. Mur Elio Murillo. 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 <laughs> I can't say the Murillo. Elio Murillo. Mori Yo, there Mori you go. Yo, got there it. You go. 
<laughs> Thanks for coming on the show, man. I think it was a good conversation. And my name is John Edmonds Cosma, the CEO of Bang Productions. Mm-hmm.